honestly a day that should be a national holiday, right? It's post-Super Bowl Monday. I'm your host, Thomas Frank Carr. This is the BWI Daily Edition. We'll get to the game in just a little bit, but really we're focusing on Penn State football and the offseason. But with the NFL twist of, yeah, uh, the Super Bowl is over. The Rams are living in their glory right now, but the rest of the NFL has already been at work trying to get better for next season, and that includes the draft and the combine and the offseason for the Penn State football players that are going to Indianapolis. So we'll get to that in just a second, and that'll be our main focus of the today of players that need to have a good combine, and I broke it into three separate categories. The first being uh, testing times, the stuff you see on TV, the underwear Olympic stuff. Who needs to have the best one of those? Then, of course, the medical is one of the is one of the most important parts of the combine for teams, getting accurate information on these players and their injury histories, which you know, we don't get from Penn State football, so they need to get all that information during the week. And then the interview process. It is a small window. It is like speed dating, but it is very important. If you're a targeted player that a team wants to speak to, they want to know more about you as a person. They want to know more about you as a player and maybe some of the things that happened to you in your college career. So we'll get into all of that in just a little bit. But the first thing is congratulations to Nick Scott and Grant Haley. They are Super Bowl champions. Nick Scott had a good run in the playoffs for the Rams. Early on was making impact plays, interceptions, pass breakups. He was only targeted once in the Super Bowl, and it was on that halfback pass by Joe Mixon. Great play action, great play design, did give up the touchdown. But after that, the Rams secondary was doing pretty well outside of Jalen Ramsey of denying downfield passes, making sure that everything was in front of them. So only the one reception for one touchdown uh, and then kept a lid on everything as a versatile safety for the Rams uh, who got back a lot of players in the secondary. So he was able to play, I think, a little more of uh, his role and not have to do Everything with Taylor Rapp coming back. They had a little more flexibility with him and Eric Weddle, that three safety rotation. But a great day for uh, Nick Scott this morning, who is a Super Bowl champion. And of course, congratulations to Grant Haley, who was picked up in October after a really rough year, uh, losing his father before the football season. Now he is a uh, special teams depth player for the Rams, who won a Super Bowl. Uh, by uh, free agency being picked up in the middle of the season. So a great story there, and two Penn Staters now that are Super Bowl champions. So who's the next one? Who's going to be on a team that makes it to the Super Bowl? Who's going to be a difference maker at the next level? Last week, I wrote uh, an article, a series of articles, about ranking Penn State's eight combine invitees from eight to one as who needs to have the biggest combine. Who needs to have the best combine? So if you want to check that out, bluewhiteillustrated.com. Sign up for just $1. It's a premium content item, so you need to have access to that. It's super easy to do, though. You have uh, sign up for $1, 12 months of access, and it's the first link in this video description. So just scroll on down and uh, check that out, and you can read the full article. But we're going to be looking at it a little bit differently. So I ranked them all, like I said. Eight through one, we're going to be t picking out players that need to have specific good interactions at the Combine in a couple of different ways. But the first person I want to highlight here as an honorable mention is Jaquan Brisker. Sort of the whole reason I wrote this is because he's viewed as a second-round pick for the most part. I, I still don't understand... He's the best defensive back I've watched at Penn State. I know that I haven't watched all the way back into the 60s and 70s, and that, you know, perspective is important here, but he is legitimately an instinctive, difference-making, playmaking football player who forces fumbles, pass, gets pass breakups, gets interceptions, and gets tackles. Like, he plays at every level of the defense. So if he goes and he has a great workout at the Combine and he puts up elite sort of numbers... I don't know how you keep him out of the first round. I, 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 I don't usually believe stuff like this, but if Jaquan Brisker isn't a first-round pick, there is a legitimate bias against certain schools at certain positions because Penn State has never had a defensive back taken in the first round. And it just blows my mind. It just that there was not a Terrell Edmonds 
that was a guy who somebody overvalued or somebody really liked and they took him in the first round anyway. And not to pick on the Steelers defensive back from Virginia Tech, but just uh, randomly a guy gets in the first round sometimes. <laughs> or or you hit on a guy that's been, you know that's a good football player. Um, Jaquan Brisker is that guy. He absolutely is a good enough football player to be drafted in the first round. So I think it's going to happen. And the combine can help solidify that, but I, I, please, what am I missing? What am I missing about Jaquan Brisker? So anyway, he's our honorable mention on the list, and the reason we we wrote the list in the first place is is to protest the idea that we're not having the conversation that he's a first round pick like we are about uh, Jahan Dotson. So let's break this out now. Our list of three players here on the BWI Daily Edition of who needs to have a good combine. The first one is Rashid Walker. Now, Rashid Walker is going to, t- I'm fairly confident he's going to test well. He's a very athletic football player, but I think he needs to have a great interview process at the combine with teams because there was a lot of expectations placed on him internally and externally that he did not meet last season. When you have expectations you don't meet, that you have to ask why. So questions I might have if I were a scout or a GM. Were you using some sort of different technique this year? Because Phil Troutwine came in as the coach uh, at the offensive line position, not really a step forward. Uh, what led to the level of play? Just in your words, what was the level of play that you produced and why? And then a couple other things of, you know, was there an injury issue? Did you not get along with the coaching? I'm just throwing out hypotheticals. I'm not saying that any of these things are likely, but these are some of the questions you might have for a guy who is going to test well at the Combine, and then he he sort of needs to have a reason of why he didn't play well last year. So the last question being, okay, so if you don't play left tackle, do you see yourself as a left tackle only? Are you willing to play other positions? And if he tests well, and he because that's a part of it, is he's going to need to do all of those things, come in at the right size and, and all of that. But if he interviews well, that can make his stock go up because he is an athletic football player. He is one of the most talented offensive linemen to come through Penn State in a while. So that's why the questions, the disconnect between that and his then level of play. So some team is going to like his athleticism, and they're going to want to give him the benefit of the doubt. They're going to want to draft him. That's why he's going to the Combine, by the way, is that it has nothing to do with his level of play. It's that teams are interested, and they want to know more. So if they get the medical information back, and they get to talk to him, and they can see things and hear things, and go through some, maybe even go through some film and say, hey, what happened here? If he passes all of that, that, that makes his draft stock in him make him much more appealing as a football player at the next level. Now, let's go with one that everyone's aware of. Let's go with the testing numbers. Now, these can alter somebody's draft stock significantly. Are they overvalued? Yes, they're overvalued. But they are important because some teams draft on only the metrics and prototypes of the position. So... Let me give you an example. If you are a linebacker and you are not six foot two, some teams will not draft you. If you do not have 33 plus inch arms as a defensive end, some teams will not draft you. If you don't run a certain speed or have a certain height as a corner, some teams will not draft you. And we've seen individual uh, GMs and sometimes owners going all the way back to Al Davis who just fall in love with the freak athletes and say, okay, we're going to draft that guy and I don't care what he looks like on the football field. He's speed, strength, size, power. He's got all of it. And the guy who can do the most, now there's a couple of guys, but I think the guy who can do the most for his draft stock and needs it the most is Jesse Lucetta because his transition and his film at defensive end is incomplete so then we're going to be going on physical profile showed up at 261 at the senior bowl and played really well so here are the metrics at 261 he needs to excel at the 40 yard dash and the 10 split off of the 40 yard dash your initial get out out of the box and then your long speed if he has good numbers there and then you know his acceleration drills and his explosiveness drills vertical jumps jumps and broad jumps if he can uh, do those well, then he is going to significantly significantly increase his draft stock because he's a bit of a 
Schrodinger's cat when it comes to a defensive end. Do you look at him as a guy who just transitioned to defensive end and has tons of upside? Or do you look at his film and say, he did not know how to rush the passer, 12 pressures all last season, primarily rushing the passer. Penn State's other defensive end going after the quarterback opposite of Arnold Ebikidi. He showed flashes of just like great stuff, but only I think one or two sacks. So which which side of the coin do you land on? Do you see things in his game that you feel you can work with and you can use all of that raw potential? If he runs a sub four six, some four five eight forty yard dash, and he has a ten yard split that's you know one point five seconds or something like that, a really good one uh, ten yard split. If he can do those things and have a 34-inch vertical jump or anything higher than that, then he's a freak. He's an athletic freak. You see it on film. He's explosive. He's he's violent with his hands. And this is the same thing I'll say about uh, that I said about Adafi Owe that I'll say about Jesse Lucchetta. He knows how to use his hands. He is a great run defender who sheds blocks and understands how to get around tight ends and guys on the edge of the line of scrimmage. I don't think you should have a, a worry about his run defense, which is a bonus. He did prove he's a good run defender from the defensive end position. His reaction time, his ability to get tackles for loss and valuable plays for the defense, there's no question about that. But if you're drafting for his upside, how good of a pass rusher can he be? Do you feel you can teach him these things and you're only going to take that risk on a guy that has that athleticism. So to get into the third round, and that's where I think he is the, the projection for sleeper pick with great talent, can be a hybrid player, sort of. I don't think it matters if he has his hand in the dirt or not. I really don't care about that. But if you want to be a pass rusher, you need to have those physical metrics. He's got the size. This is the next thing he has to prove. And then finally, this one is important because it's such a shadowy unknown, especially coming from Penn State, is the injury history for a guy like Tariq Castrofields. And here's the thing. Tariq Castrofields missed all of 2020 with, a, or most of 2020, with an injury. But it's not like that was the only time, nicked up, banged up, blah, blah, whatever it was, that there was a conversation about Tariq Castrofields injuries weren't too far away from he's gritting it out, he's being gutty through this. So what is that information? What sort of injuries? What sort of situations has he recovered from? Because that can also then add some perspective to his film, to his play on the field. Now, he needs to have a great combine overall. So he needs to ace all of these things. Tariq is a, is a, is a really uh, intelligent, introspective sort of person when you talk to him. So the interview process is not going to be a problem for him. I don't think he's going to have a hard time acing that. But then it becomes the on the field things. He's not uh, he's not overwhelming in any one metric and he's not overwhelming from what you've seen on film in any one athletic trait. So having really solid numbers across the board. That's important. And then a team deciding that the, he's a scheme fit and they can use him productively in their offense. But it all comes back to him with the medical stuff. Is he going to be able to hold up at the next level? Is he going to be able to handle playing in the NFL? And what sort of stuff is going on with the injuries? So, and by the way, you could say that for any of these guys. You could say that for every single one of these guys going to the combine. There have been no obvious injuries to a guy like Jahan Dotson that come to mind. But still, what don't we know? Football is is not a, a game that leaves an impact that doesn't leave an impact on a player. So that's a that's I think a fair thing to point out. So those are the uh, the three players in different situations and scenarios, the three different aspects of the combine that I think really need to have strong combines to put them in the round that they want to be in when it comes to their ability to maximize their draft potential. And there's one last thing I do want to talk about today, and this is something that came up on the Blue White Illustrated message board when it comes to the guys that declared for the draft. Jesse Lucchetta is one guy that a lot of Penn State fans think should have come back for his senior year. Does he learn how to rush the passer better? Maybe. Maybe he does. Maybe he, does, maybe he doesn't. Maybe he gets marginally better, and it's a perception thing. As far as physically, Jesse Lucchetta, there's, I don't think there's going to be any problem. 
Another guy, Brandon Smith. Junior, could have stayed for another year, decided to leave early after what I think is an over-exaggeration of his play in 2021. It was not perfect, but the things that are his calling card, playing in space, highlight plays, um, and then a variety of ways to get to the football. He was good at those things, and he showed some improvement as a run defender in the box at a new position last year. So again, kind of like Lucetta, on film, you can see what you want from Brandon Smith, who is going to, and let me look at, he is going to be a top 100 draft pick. So when it comes to these decisions, and you say, come back, stay another year, you'll make more money next year. Life-changing money. If you're a second-round pick, you're guaranteed $1.5 million. Guaranteed. Your, your, your base salary your second year is 900000 This is just an example I found. Pete Werner, that was his, uh, his base salary according to SpotRack.com. So that's life-changing money. That is absolutely life-changing money. So if you've put yourself in a position where if you know your testing numbers and you're Jesse Lucchetta and you know, like, I'm going to blow it up at the Combine and I'm going to learn to play defensive end in the NFL, I'm going to be that guy as a third-round pick or whatever, however high you think you're going to go. Or if you're Brandon Smith and you've got elite physical traits, and we know from talking to Dwight Galt last offseason that he has elite physical traits from a testing perspective and he played well in coverage last season. So, there's, there, again... He had good things that he did, and, and the NFL's looking for coverage linebackers. Go to the NFL because, uh, I mean, that's a lot of money. I understand once you get to your second contract or if you want to be, say, be a first-round pick, you can't guarantee that even coming back for your senior year for one more year and making yourself maybe a first-round pick, and maybe you're a second-round pick now, and the slot difference is 20 slots in the draft. Now, the, the, there is that conversation, but if you're telling me that I'm maybe like 75, 80% guaranteed to make $5 million over the course of my rookie contract, and I understand it's not all guaranteed, but if you're a second round pick, the team's not going to give up on you in three years. That's a go to the NFL situation. And I just think that when it comes to those decisions, we tend to look at the large numbers and then anything below a first or a top 50 pick as a mistake going. The money in the NFL is ridiculous, even in the third and fourth round. So I, I think it's a little bit more of a gray situation, even when it comes to that side, let alone the play on the football field and the things, by the way, that determine whether or not a team is going to draft you because some teams... Uh, the film is one thing, but they're looking for, like I said, they're looking for prototypes of the position, players that they think they can get more out of and values in that situation. So just my thoughts on that. That'll do it today for the BWI Daily Edition. I'm your host, Thomas Frank Carr. One last thing. Uh, I know a lot of you listen to this on uh, podcast form and you listen to it on Apple Podcast. And I super appreciate everyone who, who subscribes and downloads and all that stuff. If you're on Apple Podcasts, you're always trying to beat the algorithm. If you're doing something like this, you're trying to, okay, so we need X, Y, and Z. So if you want to help me out, you want to help the BWI Daily Edition grow, give it a five-star review, leave a comment. It's super appreciated. And of course, if you're if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe and you hit the notification so you don't miss the Daily Edition when it comes out. I am your host, Thomas Frank Carr. We will talk to you tomorrow. <laughs>